Good day, this is Len Lazarick with MarylandReporter.com. We're talking here today with the authors of a new book on Maryland government and politics, uh, Herb Smith, a professor at uh, McDaniel College, longtime professor of political science and commentator on Maryland politics, and John Willis, who is head of the government and public policy program at the University of Baltimore. Thanks for being with us today. It's good to be with you, Len. Absolutely. So, the subtitle of your book is Democratic Dominance. Is that because you two guys are Democrats, or why, why the subtitle? Well, <clears throat> no, it has to do more with institutions. One of the interesting things about Maryland is the durability of its political and uh, governmental institutions. And the structure of the party has been the same since 1827. And it has gone through a number of periods but still maintained its governmental control over the operation of state government. So it's more reflective of a reality. It's not a a contemporary word, although it happens to fit today because we are, as the Gallup poll indicated, uh, uh, among the most currently democratic states in the Union, but it's more about the durability and the structure. Herb? And we, we quote uh, Frank Kent, who back in 1910 talks about the, uh, the history of Maryland politics since after the Civil War is the history of the Maryland Democratic Party. That was 1910. And it's a quote that is still appropriate today, uh, that the democratic dominance has you know, very deep roots in Maryland, but it, it's not due to, to people simply you know, voting Democrat because the, their fathers were Democrats. The Democratic Party uh, has changed as, as the, the actors within the Democratic Party. This was changed. actually a very different Democratic Party that, that he was writing about in 1910. It, it's a polar opposite today. I mean, the Democratic Party of the, uh, the turn of the, from the uh, 19th to 20th century was you know, profoundly conservative, borderline racist, uh, states' rights uh, supported segregation. Bo borderline racist? <laughs> uh, I, I, think that, that, that's, I think that's a little kind. Right? Overtly, you had you had uh, speeches on the General Assembly floor by leaders there that would make people shudder and today. And the, the Poe Amendment votes and, and, and what have you. Uh, but the, the, the party certainly you know, changed radically. Um, from a, from a states' rights orientation that, that went well into the New Deal uh, with Governor Ritchie um, to a, a much more progressive, uh, much more proactive, uh, a, a party that, that sees government as a tool and, and not an enemy, and that has certainly been pro-civil rights and, and proactive in, in many progressive policy but, areas. But your, your book would not... Uh First of all, the audience of, uh, for your book is, is really pretty wide range. You're going to use it in class, but it's also for people who are interested in overall political history of Maryland. I mean, who, who, is, the, who is the book for? Well, I think that's, it, it does go the range. It's a, it's a course that I've been teaching for uh, well over a decade. Um, it is also uh, a book that can be used in other colleges and universities in some selected secondary schools. I think would be interested in it. Uh, also, those people who were interested in understanding what makes, you know, creates the Maryland identity, what creates the, the an understanding of the historical context in which a particular election uh, may be found, are going to find this very useful. And it's a, it's something you can, uh, it's not going to go out of uh, out of date. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We have a population of 5.7 million people. They all should read this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, as well as people from other states who may want to understand how how the Maryland dynamic came to be, what it is, and how a political party, party regardless of ideology, has been able to sustain itself for uh, well into uh, second century. But I would have to say... A Republican in Maryland reading this book would not gain a lot of encouragement from your analysis of registration and voting patterns and things like that. Well, there, there are some aspects that I, 
I, I would have to, to say that, I mean, overall, it's probably a depressing read for a Republican with statewide aspirations. However, I mean, there are, the notion that Republicans cannot win in Maryland was certainly dispelled in, in 2002 by, by Governor Ehrlich, and it, it is possible. Um, the fastest growing voter group in the state of Maryland are independents. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Baltimore metropolitan area, you have you know, strong Republican majorities in Hartford and in, in Carroll County. Uh, but basically for Republicans to win in the short term, they need a divided Democratic Party um, and, or an exceptionally weak Democratic statewide candidate. Uh, but this is not to say that the Republicans cannot build uh, for the future, and, and they should be. Yeah, there's, there are parts, uh, one of the assignments that uh, students in my class get is to examine a legislative district or a county and determine its political character. And we have extraordinarily diversity among our counties. I mean, in, in Garrett County, there are no... Uh, Democratic office holders. In Montgomery County, there are no Republican office holders. So we have extremes uh, which mirror somewhat of what's going on. But we also talk about, and, and we spend some time talking about the McKeldin template of how does a Republican win statewide. And they have won statewide, I mean, only six times since the Civil War, or six different Republican governors since the Civil War. But uh, that template is different than the national Republican Party template. And it would, it, it, so it, when you're talking about a person, a person could win. I could conceive of a situation of a, of a county exec from a suburban county compiling a record that was fairly moderate and maybe reaching, building coalitions that if they followed the McKeldin template, might be but able to win. But basically, Herb, it's it's a moderate Republican can win. And as you described the 2002 election, Bob Ehrlich ran as a moderate Moderate was Republican. the second word out of his mouth, well, uh, you know, throughout that campaign. And, and But he governed as a conservative Republican. That, that was one of his fatal mistakes to, to basically... This was a tremendous opportunity for Maryland Republicans in terms of, of Governor Ehrlich's term. And he governed like a Gingrich Republican uh, rather than the, the Bob Ehrlich who campaigned in 2002 as a, as a moderate uh, re Republican. Um, although some of a, his a policy... A Gingrich Republican perhaps without the big ideas, though. In, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Well... The vitriolic rhetoric, yeah. uh, the, the attacks on the liberal media all the time, the, the attacks on multiculturalism, which in terms of the Maryland context of tremendous population diversity is almost suicidal. So, so to wrap up here, what's, what's the biggest takeaway you would like the people to get from, from reading this book about Maryland and Maryland politics? I'll try to be brief, but I think Maryland's intrinsically interesting for the durability of our political and governmental institutions spanning centuries. And this, we try to write this with giving you the context and the perspective that would allow you to have understanding of a particular issue or a particular campaign. It's... Maryland is, is fascinating to me because I, I think it, it's where America will be in the 21st, you know, later in the 21st century. The diversities of this state produce pressures on policymakers to solve ascetic a uh, mine runoff in western Maryland, or urban pathologies in, in Baltimore, the Chesa pollution of the Chesapeake Bay, poultry runoff on the eastern shore. The pressures and challenges are, are, are manifest. And here in Maryland, we don't see government as the enemy. We see government as the tool to promote a better quality of life for all of us. Well, thank you, John Willis. Thank you, Herb Smith. Thank you all for watching today at MarylandReporter.com.